Hey, what's happening everybody? This is Jared Bankins. You're now watching the Venom vlog with my homie Seek. Now don't forget to catch me as Isaac and Sony Pictures Venom, premiering October 5th, 2018 in theaters. And you can also catch me on Sci-Fi Channel and USA Network's The Purge, premiering September 4th, 2018. Enjoy the show. <laughs> What's up, everyone? Welcome to the 250th episode of Spitting Venom, a.k.a. The Venom Vlog. And I want to take a minute before we get into today's episode to thank all of you very, very much for supporting the show, for pushing me to, you know, reach this uh, amount of episodes in this amount of time. And we started about uh, 10 months ago on November 5th of 2017. And we are nearing September 5th of 2018, and we are one month away from the movie. We're about, a, you know, 34 days or so away from the movie. And I'm very excited that we're this far in. I always hoped that I would get at least 100 episodes of this show in. The main reason I wanted to do this show, uh, outside of, you know, me liking Venom and me being curious about the movie and me wanting to follow something and track something like a movie, um, and then maybe educate and kind of show a little bit behind the scenes, because I watch a lot of people on YouTube, and I know I notice a lot of them talk about movies, but they don't really understand, like, the process of making movies. And... Granted, I don't get every single thing right. I've only worked on a few things, but I thought I could bring something to the table and try to educate in some way, especially from a marketing standpoint and you know help people understand why certain decisions make it made. And that's and I thought Venom would be a good opportunity to do that. And so far, it's been going pretty well. And I thank all of you for enjoying it. I'm glad you are and for getting us to over you know almost a thousand subscribers since we started this show. Uh, that is huge and it means a lot to me. You got my channel remonetized because you support the show and so for that I will always be grateful and I'm very thankful for you guys for doing that for me and uh, and I hope I you know I continue to make good content for you guys in return but like I said the main reason I wanted to do this show was also on a personal level to show myself that I could actually commit to something because I have been working on a Kickstarter project that's taken a lot longer to finish than I originally thought and uh, it's been very difficult for me just trying to you know visualize stuff for those who don't know I had head trauma injury a brain aneurysm rupture in 2010 and although sometimes you know I have really good days where I feel like I could kind of picture stuff in my head the the damage to my visual memory and stuff makes things harder to do so when I did comics it was a little bit easier because I could rely on artists to bring stuff to life but now I'm writing a novel and now it's become a series of novels and it's expanded bigger than I originally planned and so when I had you know lost control of this thing I was you know felt creatively stunted I felt like all right I, I can I not stick to my guns like what's I found myself taking you know breaks uh, from writing and I was like you know I need something to be consistent to keep that creativity going and so this show has done that and we've done 250 episodes in 10 months and I'm very happy to say that it's also got me writing and finishing up Neverland and getting that you know back on a path to where it's near finished uh, and that's all again because of you guys supporting the show uh, you know you think you're just watching a show and you're commenting and you're chatting with me but you're also you know reinvigorating me and it, it means a lot so again on a personal level thank you for this and we are going to try so hard to get to as near as 300 episodes as we can before the movie comes out uh, but with my schedule and with you know writing this TV show pilot that I'm working on, which I can't say any more about, I've already said too much. Uh, but since I'm working on that, I can't. Uh, I don't have a ton of time. I was hoping to do an episode a day for the last 30 days leading up to the movie, and I don't think I'll be able to. I'll try my best. I'll get as many episodes out as I can, as you guys know I will. Uh, but I think by the time the movie comes out, we might land around episode 275 or so like that. So I'm thinking I can hopefully at least get 25 new episodes out between now and the film coming out. So wish me luck on that. I'll do what I can. I'll try to cover everything I can, but there will be TV spots and other things that I may not cover as to not, you know, because we're going to start getting into maybe spoiler territory. We might see new things. I saw new interviews going up this week. Uh, there's, you know, new promotional stuff going on. We'll talk about as much of it as we can that I can get to. Uh, but if anything I miss major that I don't make a video on, we'll talk in our live chats when we stream like the Spider-Man game that comes out next week or when we, you know, stream Resident Evil or anything like that. We'll talk about anything I miss in those. So make sure you join us live on YouTube for those events as well and on twitch when we play spider-man um so yeah again just thank you thank you for getting us here and without further ado let's dive into tonight's episode which is called new ways to die and real quick before we dive into the story let's just kind of paint a picture of the universe so far in the marvel universe uh, obviously last time we saw spider-man 
he was in uh, the Back in Black storyline, and we talked about Eddie Brock having cancer, and he was in the hospital, and he was being told by the voice in his head, the little remnants of symbiote that's left in his bloodstream uh, was kind of manifesting in his mind and saying, go kill Aunt May, she's sick, she's in a hospital bed, go kill her. And of course, Eddie Brock goes to do it, but he does the right thing in the end. He redeems himself in the eyes of Peter Parker, and he decides not to kill Aunt May and then tries to kill himself, but Peter Parker saves him. Uh, and so Eddie Brock now is you know, still battling that voice in his head a little bit, but it's not enough to manifest a full symbiote. It's just enough in there to kind of drive him crazy. So that's kind of where we last left Spider-Man. But in the meantime, since then, he being Spider-Man and Mary Jane made a deal with Mephisto, AKA the devil of the Marvel Universe, or one of them anyway, and they made a deal with him. I know, sounds stupid, right? Uh, and it was. And what they did was, it was a big storyline that you know a lot of fans hated. It retconned a lot of stuff in Spider-Man's history. And it really, in a, in, a, in a very forced way, like in a very obvious way, not like a, a, a clever retcon of any kind, but like a full-on like business move retcon. And a lot of people got upset by that and you know kind of turned away from Spider-Man for a while. And so what happened in this deal that Peter and Mary Jane made with Mephisto was that uh, everyone would forget that Peter Parker was Spider-Man. So everyone all of a sudden has amnesia. And I always kind of wondered about this, because if you remember our Venom episodes where he meets Ghost Rider, Ghost Rider does the penance stare on uh, Venom, but uh, it doesn't work on Venom, the, the supernatural element of hell that has no effect on this alien creature. So I'm kind of curious, I always was curious how Mephisto was able to, you know, cause some spell that would make the symbiote forget that Peter was Spider-Man. I can understand maybe making Eddie Brock or Matt Gargan forget but the symbiote, I was kind of curious, since it seemed to be unaffected by supernatural abilities before. Uh, but again, maybe I'm reading too much into that, <laughs> and maybe I'm underestimating Mephisto's power. Uh, but so with that going on, you know, now we have Peter Parker. He's back, you know, working for the Daily Bugle. Actually, at the beginning of the story, he gets fired from the Daily Bugle, and he's taking pictures again, and he starts, uh, you know, trying to make his way back, and, you know, get get back into uh, his life, I guess. And him and Mary Jane are now broken up. They're not married anymore, and that was the big retcon that happened was that they never got married. So they've split apart, uh, unfortunately, uh, for a lot of fans, I would say. Definitely unfortunate. Uh, but then on the Thunderbolt side, after the whole debacle with them being attacked inside their mountain uh, and, you know, uh, superheroes like Dila superheroes coming right in and, and getting themselves arrested and then using their psychic powers to turn the whole team against each other. At this point, Norman Osborn has started to slowly win back the public. Uh, they're going out there, him and his Thunderbolts, and they're doing like little deeds and little, you know, good jobs and everything here and there. And they're trying to get back in that spotlight. And you'll see that in this story once we get into it, that Norman Osborn is a little bit more uh, liked by people than he was at the end of that first arc where people were like, oh man, th you know, that team is vicious and, you know, all those heroes got the, uh, you know, the, the members of the Thunderbolts to lash out at them and, uh, you know, Venom bit off, you know, still Spider's arm and stuff. And so the public started to get really worried about them. Well, at this point, they're starting to reel it back in. They're starting to, you know, contain themselves a little bit better, and Norman Osborn's getting a little bit more of a better grip on his insanity uh, as we go through this storyline. So what we're going to see here is we're going to see Peter Parker's life get invaded by the Thunderbolts, and we're also going to see the introduction of a new character, uh, also part old character, named Anti-Venom. Chapter 1, Back with a Vengeance. So in this story, we open up and it has like a little kind of, almost like what we talked about in Batman Hush, where they did like a little two-page Here's Peter Parker, this is who he is, this is how he became to be, you know, kind of thing. And so it shows him, you know, getting the spider powers and Uncle Ben dying, him going to be a wrestler, uh, Aunt May and him grieving over that, and then him catching the burglar. So it kind of goes over that at the beginning of the story, but then it dives you right into him being fired from the Daily Bugle, which is now called the DB, and it has a new owner. Uh, J. Jonah Jameson is no longer the owner of the company that he was, you know, kind of the newspaper he was running for so many years. And so Peter uh, is always at odds with this new guy. This new guy does not like Peter Parker's work ethic. Uh, he doesn't have the sympathy that, you know, J. Jonah Jameson always had on Peter Parker, where he always felt like he was a good kid. Uh, you know, Peter's getting older, and uh, this guy has no patience. He's like, look, dude, you got to start working like an adult. And obviously, Peter has numerous logical reasons why he can't. Obviously, he's Spider-Man, uh, but it is affecting his life. So he gets fired, and once again, we have a Peter Parker that's broke. We also are, uh, you know, get a, a look at Menace, who is this like new character, kind of like a Green Goblin type, but they're gray. 
and they're going around, you know, causing a lot of damage. And then Spider-Man shows up and takes Menace down. And uh, and so Spider-Man, this is him again, just kind of in full swing, trying to get his life back together. He's broke. He's trying to, you know, take. He's got these pictures that he's taken, and he's trying to sell them, but the DB won't have them. And after he gets into this fight with Menace, he actually sees these people that are like coming out of this building that were being held against their will underneath the building. So once like this part of this building exploded, he saw people trying to come out. And so he goes and helps them out. And uh, also as Peter Parker, he sets up a camera and he's taking pictures. Uh, and you're actually gonna see some cool things that Dan Slott added, uh, I think he added. I'm not sure if this was in the continuity before, but it was something I thought was pretty neat. And it plays a part in the story, which is how Peter Parker always gets really good shots of Spider-Man at this point in his career, because Spider-Man seems to always be dead center frame, uh, but the camera's always like somewhere else away. And there's a piece of technology that Peter Parker has that helps this happen. He has a little device in the spider on his chest and the camera tracks it. So wherever he goes, the camera is definitely gonna zoom in and take a picture of him in that area. So it always gets him. So that's gonna be something that comes back and plays later on. But when Peter sees these people that were like held against their will and it looks like they've been you know, tested on and they look sick and everything, uh, he takes these pictures and he tries to sell them somewhere but no one will have them except Frontline. And Frontline is owned by Ben Urich. Ben Urich uh, being the great reporter that used to work at the Daily Bugle with Peter Parker and now uh, has his own thing going on over at Frontline. And he's got a lot of people like uh, Joe Robbie Robertson and other people, Cat Grant, I think, that all used to work for Daily Bugle are now, you know, kicking butt over here at Frontline. And so Spider-Man goes over there, or Peter goes over there, and is able to sell the pictures to them. And one of their, you know, journalists is like, all right, I'm going to run with the story. I'm going to go dig and find out what I can on this storyline. So Spider-Man's like, all right, great. I made a few dollars. Now let's see if I can get back out there and, again, continue to pick up my life. So he calls up Harry Osborne and his friend who is because of the retcon and because of the deal with Mephisto, Harry Osborn has been brought back to life. These are one of the many things that happened as like the ripple effect of Peter and Mary Jane never getting married is that somehow Harry Osborn never died. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a very confusing thing, but so just buy into the fact that Harry Osborn's <laughs> back and he's still alive. Um, and then meanwhile, the new guy named Crown, who's trying to run for like mayor of the city or is mayor of the city, he is, you know, worried about Spider-Man getting involved in his stuff because of this, you know, this thing that happened uh, with the people getting out although they don't say it's him directly but he's just like wow spider-man you know seems to always be in the right place at the right time and exposing things and i don't want to have to deal with this and since he's an unregistered hero i'm going to hire someone to come and shut him down and so what he does is he reaches out to norman osborne and the thunderbolts and says hey look you're from new york there are people here that love you why don't you guys come and uh, you bring your team here and you guys hunt down spider-man once and for all and of course norman osborne's like yeah I'm into this. <laughs> and so he decides to sign up and he's like, all right, Crown, I'll come and help you. Uh, no problem. And here's my plan. And then meanwhile, we cut to Aunt May. And I like that they did this in the storyline. It was one thing that Dan Slott brought in that I liked. There was this character named Mr. Negative that got introduced. And then he runs this place called Feast, uh, which is like a homeless shelter. And they you know feed the homeless of New York uh, since the population of the homeless is rising there. And uh, this is something that's going to be in the new Spider-Man video game, which is pretty cool. And Martin Lee is the person who runs it. But secretly, he's Mr. Negative. And he has this power to you know affect negative energies or inverse energies and stuff. And uh, he's a pretty cool character. I like as far as new characters go, he's really neat. And Aunt May works here. She helps out at this homeless shelter and volunteers here to, you know, to help uh, feed the homeless of New York. And what we find out is that Eddie Brock also is a volunteer here. So in this storyline, we see Eddie Brock recovering, slowly recovering from cancer. He, at this moment, still thinks he has it. We're gonna find out some cool twists in the storyline. So he's like, all right, I'm here. I'm, I'm just here to help. I have cancer. I'm going through all this stuff, but I wanna help people. So he signs up for this, and Martin Lee's like, yeah, this is one of our greatest achievements is that we have Eddie Brock here because there's a news reporter who's coming to look, you know, uh, who's digging around, looking at the neighborhood, trying to figure out how those people were held against their will and stuff and being tested on. So they just, she just happened to come in here and sees what's going on and she's doing a, a piece on Martin Lee and Martin Lee says hey uh, you know this is Eddie Brock he used to be Venom and uh, then he got cancer and then now he's here helping us uh, you know at our shelter and I believe in second chances you know and all this stuff and so Martin Lee is really good with the press really good at uh, you know uh, selling himself and uh, and getting people to trust him and like him uh, but any supervillain is right and so as he introduces uh, Eddie here he's touching him on the shoulder and Eddie's uh, body is reacting to uh, Martin Lee's powers. So secretly, Martin, uh, Martin Lee is holding, you know, he's touching the back of Eddie, and uh, there's a, like, 
you know, inverse energy electricity going through Eddie. And what's happening is it goes into his body and it's attacking the symbiote cells. And there's something in Martin Lee's power that's affecting those little strands of symbiote that are still in Eddie's body. And they start mutating them into white cells. So all the black little symbiote cells that are in there start mutating into white cells. Uh, and then it's at this moment where the first chapter ends and Peter Parker comes home after a long day of, hey, I finally made some money. I'm coming home to my roommate. And then he walks in the door and who does he see? Norman Osborn and the Thunderbolts. When this first chapter came out in single issue form, it was a pretty thick book. Uh, obviously it was starting a new six part storyline called New Ways to Die. So to fill in some of the page count, what they also did was they put this backup story in called The Interlude, uh, which is uh, I think called Fifth Stage is the name of the actual story. And it's written by Mark Wade and it's drawn by Adi Granov. He's the guy who did that cool uh, airplane we saw that uh, Tom Hardy posted on his Instagram. He did the artwork of Venom on, on the side of that airplane. Um, so this is Adi Granov's work. He, a uh, very well-known artist, uh, did a lot of stuff for the Iron Man movies early on, and he did uh, Extremis, the comic book Extremis, uh, with Warren Ellis. And his artwork is great, very awesome digital paint style. And uh, we see here, it's a short story with Eddie Brock, you know, still dealing with cancer, and he signed up to be a test subject for something at Oscorp. And apparently he didn't qualify. And he's like, what do you mean I didn't qualify? I'm like, you know, near death here. Like, you know, I, I should have qualified. What's going on? So the good thing about all this is, you know, last time we saw Eddie, you know, he was in that hospital and just kind of like, all right, he's he cut his wrist at this point. He's, you know, this guy has attempted suicide a couple times, jumped out of a window and Spider-Man saved him. And so now we have him here just at his lowest. And he's like, all right, I want to sign up for some test project so maybe someone can you know t work on me test on me and and you know maybe something good could come out of it for humanity and so uh so he signed up and he's not admitted and so at this point you know the voice starts coming back he starts hearing that symbiote voice in his head again he goes back to a feast and he's like you know what i'm going to go to the one place where i feel useful where i feel like i actually am helping humanity and i'm going to go back and serve food at the feast uh homeless shelter and uh, and help people out there so when he gets there he sees aunt may he sees martin lee and he starts serving food and there's like this some biker dude with a chip on his shoulder who I think knows Eddie Brock or knew Eddie Brock as Venom or heard he was Venom and uh, is like oh you're a tough guy now so he starts you know smacking Eddie Brock around he pushes like the food tray off he's like I don't want food from you you're a monster and then Eddie snaps uh, this is the first time in a while that he's shown any rage or hard emotion like that and he snaps and he starts beating the crap out of this guy and then when he looks up he sees that he has bloody fists Martin Lee has stopped him from hitting the guy any further uh, and Aunt May is there and she goes oh Eddie please no this 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 is not how you have to behave, you know, being the sweet old Aunt May that we know. And so he's like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll get out of here, I'll get out of here. So he runs off and it's at this point where he goes back to his doctor and he's like, all right, just tell me the bad news. Just tell me I don't have many, you know, that much time left to live because I keep screwing up, I keep ruining everything. So please doc, just hit me with the truth. And the doctor says, well, actually uh, you're cured of cancer. Uh, there's nothing inside of you that is cancerous anymore. It's receded and it looks like you're gonna be okay. And Eddie just can't believe it. And so this is at that point where he goes back to the Life Foundation Foundation and uh, you know and it's like um you know, talks to Martin Lee and them. And this is where we see him in the first chapter is, uh, and then, you know, that he's healed now and he's doing a lot better. And uh, so with that touch on his back from Martin Lee, it's activated his powers and now, or this new power, and it found those symbiote strands mutated in white and is gonna transform him into something very different. All right, chapter two, the Osborne Supremacy. And in this story, obviously we pick up right where the chapter one issue left off and it has Norman Osborn and the Thunderbolts sitting inside Peter Parker's apartment. Thankfully, his roommate's not home because that would be hard to explain. But Osborn is sitting there waiting for Peter and Peter comes in. They grab him and they say, where's Spider-Man? He's like, what? Huh? You know, because obviously at this point, he, you know, no one's supposed to know he's Spider-Man. Everyone's mind has been erased. So he's like, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And they're like, yeah, look, you know, Norman Osborn's like, I'm not dumb. I, it's clear you have a working relationship with Spider-Man. You know, you're the only one who's ever taken pictures of him and got really good shots of him. So cough it up. Where is he? And Peter's like, I, dude, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know where he is. I don't know what you want from me. And they're like, we're going to toss your, you know, apartment upside down. And you have Venom, like, lifting a couch, like, throwing it. He grabs, like, a picture and smashes it. And he's having a little bit of fun doing this because he's like, hey, look, if you know Spider-Man, kid, you better cough him up because I hate that guy. <laughs> so obviously everyone in this room kind of wants, you know, Spider-Man, uh, maybe except Radio 
radioactive man and songbird they're not you know they're still kind of acting heroic trying to do the right thing uh, so they're not as bloodthirsty as the others uh, but they are still there to do their job and their job is to hunt down unregistered heroes and one of those heroes is spider-man so norman osborne's like look kid we're going to keep an eye on you i'm going to keep tabs on you and as soon as spider-man pops up if I see that you have a connection to him, I'm coming and taking you out. And so they leave, you know, and then uh, of course, you know, Spider-Man's roommate shows back up. He's like, dude, really? You trashed the place? It's like, you know, kind of one of those dumb kind of comedy moments, uh, but it kind of works. Things like that, you know, tend to work for me in Spider-Man books. Uh, but here then we have, we're back to uh, Eddie Brock and he's at Feast and he's just got the good news and he's back and he's like, all right, look, I'm doesn't look like I have cancer anymore and you know, things look like they're, you know, on the up and up for me. And he goes in and talks to Martin Lee and Aunt May and they're like, hey, congratulations. That's really great. So you kind of see after that interlude story that he's come back and is like, look, I'm sorry for lashing out at that guy. I'm sorry for what I've done. Uh, you know, and th I think this is my second chance. And, you know, and I, I think the Lord knows that I'm, I'm really, you know, feel bad about what I've done. And I think this is his way of, you know, giving me that second chance and giving me hope again. And so you see Eddie Brock kind of on the, you know, the up and up now. Uh, which is kind of nice. Unfortunately, it doesn't stay that long because it's Spider-Man's universe. Nobody gets to have, you know, like consistent happiness <laughs> in Spider-Man's world. Uh, so now we have Norman Osborn. He's taken the key to the city. Uh, Crown has come in and said, hey, this is my guy. Uh, we're, you know, I I'm in charge of protecting New York City. And so Thunderbolts have had a good track record lately with their, you know, superhero hunting. And so uh, I've talked to the government. I've talked to everybody. We, uh, you know, hiring these guys to come in and take down any unregistered heroes in our city, starting with Spider-Man. And even though Spider-Man is kind of liked by some people at this moment, also, you know, after what happened in Civil War and everything, people are still, they may have forgotten, you know, you know Spider-Man is Peter Parker, but they didn't forget about the damage and the collateral damage from Civil War and also the events that the New Warriors happened with, you know, the Stanford explosion and stuff uh, with all those people lost. So, you know, people are still skeptical of heroes and they want them to sign up and be registered so that they feel safer with them. And, you know, it's like having a bunch of people, you know, it's like cops, untrained cops running around. So they're like, that's how they equate it. And they're like, no, we need trained superheroes uh, that are trained by, you know, government officials or something. So, you know, Norman Osborn, after that whole speech and everything, like, hey, I'm here to save you guys. You're welcome. Uh, he decides to go check in on his son, Harry Osborn, and his new girlfriend. And when he gets there, he sees that Harry is running like a coffee shop and uh, and it's a successful one, but it doesn't matter because Osborne is like, this is what you did. You left our company to go run a coffee shop. And uh, and he's like, yeah, I don't care. He's like, you continue to fail me and uh, and not impress me, son. And I am once again, I'm going to tell you, I'm not proud of you. So he's again trying to win that father of the year award <laughs> like he always does. And Norman Osborne leaves and Harry, of course, gets mad and lashed out his girlfriend. And is like, you know, just stay away from me for a while. And you see his eyes kind of turn a little red and the big thing they're trying to do is hint at him being menace uh, which seems like the obvious choice which is why it's not the real choice uh, but I won't spoil the menace thing for you guys uh, you can definitely check out some of these books later on and find out because they don't reveal it in this story so I don't have to give it away in this one so if you want to know who menace is if you're curious and if you don't already know definitely pick up spider-man comics around this time uh, is when they show it so uh, we have the Thunderbolts are scouring the city they're looking for spider-man and you have Norman Osborn with bullseye and they have them like locked down and they're like look you know if this if we can lure spider-man to an area that's not public We'll send you in Bullseye, but otherwise you're going to stay put. And it's at this moment where Bullseye gets webbed up on the mouth, webbing shoots on his mouth, and he can't speak. And Spider-Man has taken the fight to Norman Osborn. And he's like, you know what? This is my city. I ain't going to take you coming around looking for me, trying to bully me and beat me up. So uh, you already revealed your hand. You came and talked to Peter Parker. Now I know you're hunting me. So, uh, you know, obviously he doesn't say all this, but this is his plan. And he goes and he takes down, and takes the fight to them. So he webs up uh, Bullseye to make sure he can't, even if they release his restraints, he can't get out. And then he goes and just starts wailing on uh, Norman Osborn. And at this point, you know, Venom and all the other uh, members of the Thunderbolts, they're out there in New York. And they're like, all right, we got to get back to home base. We got to get back to the ship or whatever uh, and take down Spider-Man. And Osborn's like, no, you know what? We're getting attacked here. So I want you to go find someone who's related to Peter Parker. He probably gave Spider-Man the heads up on us and I want him to pay. And I think his aunt works at Feast. So Venom, go to the Feast Foundation, go to the homeless shelter and, you know, tear her apart. Uh, I want to make Peter Parker pay for giving uh, Spider-Man the heads up that we're looking for him. And then so Venom's like, got it. So he goes there, he starts tearing the place apart. And it's at this point that he finds Eddie Brock and the suit's like, Hey, I know that, you know, I know Eddie Brock and Mac Gargan's like, yeah, I do too. Let's go rough him up. So he grabs Eddie, he picks him up and he's like, you know what? He's like, you know, you've caused us a lot of pain and you've rejected the suit. You, you cast us out. You made us, you auctioned us off, you know? And, uh, and he's like, now we're with a better host, a stronger host than you ever are or ever were. And uh, starts, you know, bad mouthing him. 
and he's like, uh, but tell us where, uh, you know, this Mae Parker is, and maybe we'll let you live, and Eddie's like, uh, you know, no, and he starts mutating, and you see the white blood cells in his body, or the cells that were, you know, used to be symbiote cells that have turned from black to white, have now manifested and overtaken him, and then he becomes, at the end of this issue, anti-venom. Chapter 3, The Killer Cure. And in this one, it's pretty much just a fight between Venom and Anti-Venom through the whole book with Spider-Man caught in the middle. So when he finds out that Aunt May was attacked, you know, Spider-Man's like, all right, I'm getting out of here. Osborn, you suck. I hate you. And he jumps out of the ship and he's like, all right, I'm going to go and fight, you know, and save uh, Aunt May. But when he gets there, he sees two Venoms fighting and he's like, okay, what's going on here? Now there's a white Venom? Like what? <laughs> like what's happening? And then Anti-Venom says, you know, Spider-Man, it's me, it's Eddie Brock. And Spider-Man's like, well, that doesn't make me feel better, <laughs> you know? Uh, so they, you know, he's kind of getting in the middle of this two, you know, big, big two symbiote fight. But what Eddie has is not really a symbiote. It's a mutated, like, you know, re remnants of the first symbiote that is now mutated by Martin Lee's powers. And what happens is it's, it's like, it's what he says. He's anti-venom. If he touches anybody that has some kind of infection or radiation, like in Spider-Man, Spider-Man has radioactive blood, obviously. So he can sense that. And what he'll do is he'll plug his claws into them and, you know, tear that out till he's the killer cure essentially he will eradicate that and he sees the symbiote as a virus you know in a way uh, it's a space virus that has infected matt gargan and so now with the the bodies you know the core of him being symbiote but then being mutated with this new power that martin lee you know, has imbued with him uh into eddie uh so now he is like the perfect person to fight symbiotes with because he can tear those symbiotes to shreds and melt them away and destroy them once and for all and so it puts eddie in a very lethal spot again as a lethal protector and so they start getting into it they start fighting a couple times uh, innocent people like a, a young boy and then even a, a guy outside who's almost hit by a car they get put in danger and eddie's like no i failed and then the car is coming and spider-man swings in and knocks the car out of the way with all the strength he can he kicks the car out of the way so once again spider-man saving eddie keeping him innocent and telling him like look i understand you want to help people but uh, you got to calm down. Like you're, you're still acting erratic. You're not thinking clearly. And remember, this is Eddie within, you know, a couple hours, of, uh, you know, maybe a couple hours, maybe 24 at the most of him finding out that he doesn't have cancer anymore. So he's, he was ecstatic. He was on cloud nine. And then now he finds out he's another monster again. So th there's probably a lot going through Eddie's head. They don't really touch on it too much in the story, uh, but uh, they sh just show it in his actions with him lashing out, not thinking about people. He's kind of been rusty. He hasn't fought in a long time now. Uh, so he's, you know, kind of getting back in the swing of things himself but luckily the spider-man's there to help him out and so spider-man grabs venom and he grabs matt gargan he says come on eddie get him so eddie puts his claws in him and starts melting away the symbiote and the symbiote is screaming at, you know at eddie like you know no we, you know you knew us you know what are you doing you're killing us and eddie's like i don't care you're an infection and I, with these new powers i need to eradicate all infections and then as he's you know nearly killed the symbiote he looks up and he notices spider-man and he can sense all of a sudden that radiation he's like oh you have radioactive blood he's like spider-man let me cure you too and he goes over and he grabs spider-man hooks him in with the claws and he starts you know um draining him and so now spider-man is being drained at the end of this issue and the last page has Norman Osborn on the top of a roof, you know, left his headquarters, left the safety of his headquarters. He's like, bullseye, you stay there. This is too public. They're fighting in the street. I can't have you go down there because if the public finds out you work for us, we're done for. So you're going to have to stay here this time. And so Norman Osborn's on a roof looking down at this fight. And at this moment, Menace comes up behind him. And again, remember, they're alluding that Menace is Harry Osborn. And they just got in a fight. Norman and Harry just recently got in a fight. And Harry said that, uh, you know, heard his father, Norman, tell him that he wasn't proud of him. So, again, hinting at that it's Harry. Uh, but we're going to find out later in other issues that it's not. But it's pretty well done and executed here. And so uh, Norman turns and he looks at Menace and he's like, hmm, whose little boy are you? And uh, so hinting that he might know that it's Harry. Uh, but obviously he's going to find out that he's dead wrong. Chapter four, Opposites Attack. And in this one, we have the Thunderbolts coming in to Spider-Man's rescue, thankfully for Spider-Man. Uh, so Venom is down and their teammates are coming in, Radioactive Man and Songbird are like, all right, we gotta go shut down this new Venom creature, this anti-Venom guy. And meanwhile, it's draining Spider-Man, you know, and it's trying to cure him of his radioactivity, which also would obviously get uh, all of his powers and get rid of them. Uh, so Spider-Man is like like pleading, Eddie, don't do this, don't do this. And Eddie's like, I'm helping you, I'm helping you. Again, still with that broken moral compass, uh, you know, and also instinctively reacting. I mean, even though it's a mutated symbiote, he still has like these base instincts of the symbiote, but also that 
broken compass of Eddie Brock. Uh, so I kind of like that. I like that Dan Slott stuck to Eddie Brock's character. But even though he had a chance at redemption, he was on his, you know, second opportunity at life, uh, finding out he didn't have cancer, it's still, you know, he's still Eddie Brock at the end of the day, and he's still going to make similar choices that he's always made. He's going to fall back into uh, who he was, especially with similar powers now. Uh, slightly changed and altered, obviously, but now he has this white liquid kind of symbiote thing going around him, even though it's not a symbiote. Uh, it's like an inverse of a symbiote. Um, and so now that he has this, he's reverted back to his old ways. And, he, and I kind of like that. I like that he did that. Uh, bringing him back to basics, but not making him Venom at the same time by giving him a new identity, uh, which kind of works for me. I liked him as anti-Venom. Um, I do like him when he's back as Venom again, obviously, but I did like him as anti-Venom. There's no voice in his head, though, uh, like there was when he is Venom. So this isn't like a living, breathing creature. Uh, this is him acting uh, out, you know, and, and being in full control, which is interesting and neat and something that, uh, you know, adds a new layer to the character uh, while also, you know, uh, making it familiar, too, by seeing him look kind of Venom-ish. And so now we have the Thunderbolts and they're attacking him. Spider-Man gets away, he kind of slinks off. And meanwhile, we cut back to Norman Osborn getting into a battle on the rooftop with Menace. And Menace is beating the crap out of Norman, even to the point where Menace could have killed him. And Menace is like, you know what? You're not worth it, old man, and leaves. And Norman Osborn's like, huh, that was pretty educational. So at this moment, you can see that Norman thought it was Harry. Uh, this is all in retrospect. At this moment, we're kind of like, what, what, what's going on? So in the comics later on, when you, you find out who Menace is, you look back at this moment, and you're like, oh, Norman here knows that it's not Harry. You can tell by the dialogue. So Spider-Man is now fighting Songbird. He's fighting some of the other members, but he's like, you know what? I got to get out of here. If Anti-Venom gets his hands on me again, I'm done for. And so Anti-Venom, he has beaten Radioactive Man now, put him down, put his fingers into him, started to drain him a little bit. So now Venom's down, Radioactive Man's down, and now Songbird, she gets her orders from Norman Osborn, and he's like, get him out of there. Get, you know, get Radioactive Man, get him out of there. I'll get Venom, and we'll extract the team. We can't, uh, we can't battle this thing. Whatever this anti-Venom is, we weren't prepared for it. So they kind of hightail it and run out of there. And meanwhile, Crown is like, you know, sees this in the paper, and he's like, Norman, like you disappointed me. I paid you. I brought you in. I brought your team in. I made you guys look good. And, uh, I, you know, you were supposed to shut down Spider-Man and you didn't. So what's going on? And Norman's like, look, don't worry about it. We got everything under control. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, you know, we had to regroup. Something unexpected happened. This stuff happens a lot with these stupid superheroes. So just give us another chance. We'll, we'll take care of this. And uh, and Crown's like, you better, you know, whatever. And Norman Osborn's like, yeah, don't threaten me, dude. <laughs> you know, like I'm not, I'm not going to have it. So Norman takes his team and he goes back to the Thunderbolts. He says, look, uh, so that little thing we talked about at the beginning of the book with Spider-Man, you know, tracing himself with his camera, Norman Osborn was standing on the building and he's like, yeah, the reason I was on that building is because that's where Spider-Man's camera was. And I got a hold of it and I traced the technology in it and I see that Spider-Man is always in frame every time he goes. So he's taking his own pictures and he's giving them to Peter Parker, I guess, so they could make some money and split the profits or whatever. Uh, he goes, so Peter doesn't actually put himself in harm's way. And he goes, so Peter may not actually know how to get in touch with Spider-Man. He's like, so Peter's off the list. Like, let's not worry about Peter Parker anymore. He's like, let's just focus on, uh, focus on Spider-Man. And with this technology, that tells us a lot. He goes, because I can retrofit this and I can twist it in a way that we could use to our benefit. And Bullseye's like, how? And he goes, easy. He's like, uh, you know, we haven't used you yet, Bullseye. You know, he's been on the back burner. He goes, but we're going to lure Spider-Man in an area where you can get your shot at him. But uh, what happens is we can, you know, tweak the device on his chest. I kind of know what technology he's using. And so now we can configure it in a way to where we can make weapons and it'll fire wherever that device is. So even though Spider-Man has spider sense, he can dodge bullets, he won't be able to this time. Anything that shot at him, a trank dart, a bullet, anything we do, anything you throw, because you're bullseye, uh, even though you can already hit anything with accuracy, Spider-Man has dodged you before. So in this instance, we can actually put little chips in these things that we're shooting at them or throwing at them, and they will go right to the source. We will, you know, hack his technology and use it against them. And so that's where the book ends with Bullseye going, all right, I can get down with this. And he grabs three playing cards, throws them into the computer screen, and he's like, all right, let's go catch us a spider. Chapter five, easy targets. So what Norman Osborn doesn't know is as he's telling his group how to take down Spider-Man now by hacking his technology and using it against him, uh, it turns out Eddie Brock is disguised as a security guard as part of his elite team. So behind the Thunderbolts, you see these guards with these helmets and stuff, and one of them has little white slivers coming off of the the uh, the, the helmet and, and like the outfit, and you see that it's Eddie Brock in disguise. And what he does is he goes over and he grabs the technology, some of the stuff they're building to track down Spider-Man, and he's trying to destroy some of it, and he's smashing some of the pieces uh, so he's trying to help out Spider-Man, uh, but also keep an eye on Norman Osborn and the Thunderbolts. So he slipped in and infiltrated them, which is pretty neat. It's pretty cool of Eddie, you know, being a journalist, 
he's used to getting into situations like that and uh, and hiding in plain sight and I kind of like that I think that's pretty cool that they put that in the storyline with him infiltrating the Thunderbolts uh, which is cool and so meanwhile Matt Gargan who has been, you know, basically defeated and most of the symbiote has been destroyed, uh, it is starting to heal and pull itself back together, but it needs help. And so that's where Freak comes in. And Freak is this villain that was, uh, you know, one of the newer villains uh, during this run of Spider-Man that came in, and he's got these really extreme powers, and Norman Osborn has him hooked up to a machine, and he's siphoning off his organs and his blood and his, you know, everything that's inside of him, and using that to formulate new weapons and new things to use against superheroes. And one of the things he's working on is something that could help Matt Gargan. He's like, oh, you know what? We have this thing we've been working on. We could probably apply it to Mac and uh, create a new scorpion suit for him and put that around him while the suit, the symbiote, is healing so uh he's like hey mac i got something for you we can put you you know put a new suit on you in the meantime until your suit uh your venom suit recharges and so mac's like all right let, let's do this you know and meanwhile freak poor freak is being like dissected uh but being kept alive at the same time so again norman osborne total monster <laughs> uh so bullseye comes in he breaks into this area he's like all right we're gonna hunt down spider-man we've tracked him to this location and they go in, and Spider-Man's kind of ready for them. And then also, he has an ally that he didn't know about, which is Eddie Brock disguised as one of the guards. So as Spider-Man's fighting uh, Bullseye, uh, all these bullets that are being fired, they actually go, you know, Spider-Man thinks he has the upper hand. He's like, all right, I lured them here. I'm ready for them. Uh, their last member is Bullseye. I'm going to expose them, uh, get Bullseye's face out there, and show the world that, you know, he works for the team. But it goes against, you know, like th that plan kind of backfires because he lures them. Bullseye comes in, and he doesn't know about the, his technology being hacked. So so the bullets that are being fired at Spider-Man all land. They all hit. And they're, most of them are rubber bullets because they want them alive, obviously, because uh, they want to, you know, unmask them and do all this, you know, for New York City and say that they caught him. So he gets hit pretty hard and he hits the ground really hard. And he's like, all right, this is not good. So meanwhile, uh, to buy him some time, Anti-Venom is taking out the guards. He's trying to get them to stop firing at Spider-Man, uh, to stop hurting him. And it's at this moment when, uh, you know, he's like, hey, look, don't worry about it. You know, like, you know, let, let, let them get their guns. Let them get everything. He's like, I got a plan. And Eddie's like, yeah. He's like, well, they, they tracked you through your, your camera. And he's like, yeah, I know. I know. I'm figuring that out. He's like, so don't worry. I got a plan. So he takes, uh, you know, the technology. He uh, wraps it up in a, a spider web and he throws it at Bullseye. And so Bullseye lifts his hand to catch it uh, instinctively. And he catches it and it's webbed to his hand. And he's like, uh, what's going on here? And Spider-Man's like, yeah, dude, I know how you're tracking me. And he's like, so I figured it out. So check out the webbing. And so Bullseye looks down and he sees that spider tracer on the webbing and he's like, oh man. And so all the guards stand up, they grab their guns, they point him at Spider-Man and they fire and all the bullets go around Spider-Man and hit Bullseye right in the chest. And I love it because Spider-Man even has one of those cheesy movie one-liners where he just looks at Bullseye and goes, Bullseye. Meanwhile, back at the Oscorp building, Radioactive Man and Songbird, they've helped put Matt Gargan back together with Norman Osborn. And Norman Osborn's like, look, the kid gloves are off. You know, Bullseye's out there. He's been taken down. We got to take Spider-Man down. He's still in that secluded area. So let's go after him now. And I'm going to help you guys out as Green Goblin. So Norman Osborn suits up as a Green Goblin. He injects Matt Gargan with this new stuff. And Matt Gargan grows a new shell as Scorpion with some of the symbiote still there. So he's kind of like an amalgam of Scorpion and Venom. Uh, but he's like, all right, I'm back in action. This is, you know, rejuvenating me. This is going to protect me and the suit. I can feel it healing. So let's go into battle and let's finish this. Chapter six, weapons of self-destruction. Uh, and this is the final chapter of New Ways to Die. And in this one, we have Spider-Man and Anti-Venom are like, look, we're not going to stick around here. They sent Bullseye after us. That means they think they got us pinned. We need to get out in the open. We need to get out in the public so they can't send anything else that deadly like Bullseye after us. And Anti-Venom's like, that's a good idea. So they go out and they start swinging around the city. And uh, meanwhile, Spider-Man's like, but I think we could maybe find Norman Osborn somewhere. Uh, but uh, at, before he even gets to it, the Thunderbolts are already on him. They're already on their way to that uh, you know, warehouse. And when they get there, they take down Spider-Man. They shoot him with a blast. Songbird hits him really hard and they hit the ground. And Spider-Man's like, oh, and the, you know, they stand over him like, we got you, Spider-Man. And he's like, yeah, I'm not Spider-Man. And Anti-Venom transforms into Anti-Venom. So he disguises himself. He can still use the white Anti-Venom suit as like a symbiote and make him look like other things. Obviously, we knew that when he disguised himself as the guard. So it's cool that he has those abilities without having the, you know, added symbiote, you know, insanity to it as well. He's just full on Eddie Brock. Uh, and so he's like, nope, surprise, it's me. And he turns and 
gets them all with his like you know anti-venom web i guess and uh you know pins them all against the wall and it's kind of like a goo kind of a feature kind of like webbing uh but he hits them all up and then with radioactive man obviously it's kind of burning him so anything he touches or his like webbing touches it kind of burns uh but when he does that he doesn't notice matt gargan come in and matt's like yeah i'm back dude and he has his tail and he stings venom with it and Venom and him, you know, get their rematch, basically. And while that's happening, Songbird and Radioactive Man are trying to get out before Radioactive Man pretty much melts. And before Songbird does, too, because it's starting to burn her a little bit as well. And at this moment, Harry Osborn is, uh, you know, been captured by his father. His father's like, look, you know, this little menace creature came after me. And I'm in New York. I'm trying to deal with some things. And I found out something about you. And I need some answers, so you're coming with me. And Spider-Man's like, no, you're not going after your son. That's my friend. You know, obviously he didn't say that part, but he's like, you know, that's Harry's his best friend. So he's like, no, you're not going after him. I'm taking you down. So Spider-Man comes in and saves Harry, grabs uh, Norman Osborn, uh, who's flying around on his glider, and he grabs him and starts slamming his head through wall after wall. They're flying right through the building, and Spider-Man's just slamming his head one after the other, one wall after the other. But then they stop suddenly, and Spider-Man looks up and he sees all these people the people he took photographs of at the beginning. Not the same people, obviously, but another situation like that. That was closer to the Feast Foundation, where there was people underneath a building over in that area of town. And now this is here in the Oscorp building, and there's a bunch of people strapped to these tables, and they're sick, like the other people were, and they're all hooked up to these machines. And Spider-Man's like, what's going on here? He's like, you know, I had Norman here, and we were going through wall after wall, and I was literally, you know, going to end it. I was going to make sure he didn't get back up. But then we saw these people, and I crashed, you know, the vehicle and, like, the glider. And uh, so he's holding Norman by his hand, like, his left hand, and he's, like, holding him by the throat. And he's, like, he's, like, answer me, Norman. What is all this? And Norman's, like, this isn't me. You got the wrong Osborne. He's, like, this is what I came to talk to Harry about. And uh, so Spider-Man's, like, no, enough. And he, you know, knocks Osborne out, uh, uh, Norman out. And he looks up at Harry, and he's, like, Harry, is this true? Like, did, are these people like this is your doing and he's like I, I can explain it's it's not how it looks but meanwhile venom and anti-venom are going at it or I should say scorpion and anti-venom are going at it and the building's shaken and spider-man's like hey songbird help me get people out of here i know you're still a hero i know you're a good person help me free people so he frees him you know her and radioactive man and he's like let's get people out of this building in case something bad happens and then meanwhile we have scorpion uh, you know uh, matt gargan fighting back against anti-venom and he stings him again with his tail and he starts to drain him and he's like look i'm taking you down once and for all you've burned me you've you know ruined the suit and now me and the suit want revenge on you so Matt Gargan busts out he's finally healed up fully he busts out of the suit becomes Venom again and then him and you know anti-venom go at it uh, you know even more and they're just going slug for slug fist for fist and it's at this point that uh, you know Venom now uh, you know Matt Gargan takes his victory and he defeats anti-venom and he after that sting that last sting, it drained some of that anti-venom suit off of Eddie and now Eddie is left down on the ground and ready to be captured but at this moment you know obviously there's a lot of commotion going on people are freaking out and so uh you know scorpion or mac gargan he decides to escape and he's like all right let's just get out of here and i'll just leave eddie to die in case you know that's what happens in case this building crumbles uh the building does not crumble there's a lot of damage to it but it doesn't crumble uh but all the thunderbolts members get away and uh, and at this point you know norman osborn gives another speech out in public and he's like look we you know we couldn't get spider-man we've caused some damage and you know uh, uh, ben urich is like hey look you know we found we've done some digging we found out there was like people in your building you know, it's starting to expose Norman a little bit. And Norman's like, you know what? That wasn't me. That was my son. And I'm going to, you know, talk to him. And, you know, if he has to pay for any crimes or whatever, like, you know, we're, we'll figure it out. But Norman's trying to play the good guy, trying to stay in that spotlight, uh, even though he's had uh, massive failures since coming to New York. And Ben Urich's like, I'm going to be keeping my eye on you and I'm going to do everything I can to expose you. And Norman Osborne's like, yeah, good luck with that, you know. But meanwhile, back at Oscorp, you know, Harry's picking up the pieces of the battle. You know, the, the building's still standing, luckily. Uh, but there's a lot of damage. Damage. There's holes in the wall now, and obviously we saw those test patients and everything. Uh, but there's still one room that hasn't been discovered, and that is the Goblin Lair, where all the gear is for the Goblin. And Norman Osborn went to this room earlier by pulling a book off the bookshelf called The Rise of the Norman Empire. And that's the one book on the shelf. When you pull it, it opens a secret door, and it reveals the Goblin's Lair. And he noticed that there were some things missing in there, so now he's figuring out that menace is definitely pulling from his technology. And uh, and so now that Harry's in here, he's cleaning up the room, he's trying to get some information, trying to get something that'll clear his name or some proof that'll back up his claims. But it looks like Norman may have gone through the place already with his you know search team and everything to pull out anything that might incriminate him. 
So he's trying to find something, you know, he's trying to prove that he's some kind, you know, that he's innocent on some level and that it's not what it looks like. And so as he's there, you know, Peter's there helping him and so is Lily, which is Harry's girlfriend. And they're all working together trying to figure out, you know, some stuff, try to find some things. And at this point, you know, Harry's also opening up to Peter, telling him some of the stuff that he's been doing. But then Peter is trying to play dumb and he's like working his way to the bookshelf and he's like, he sees that one book on there and he's, he knows, he's like, if I pull that, it's going to open the goblin layer and reveal everything. He's like, so I, I can, you know, say I accidentally did it and we can expose Norman or we could, you know, he has a, a plan for this. So he's mo moving towards the bookshelf slowly and we have Harry who's left the room at this point and left Lily in there. And as Peter gets near the book, he reaches over to grab it and Lily comes out of nowhere, grabs Peter and says, you know what, you've been a really good friend to Harry and I've seen that you've been a really good guy and I think maybe I picked the wrong person to be with and I think I have feelings for you and she spins him around and kisses him and of course at this moment you're thinking oh it's just another dramatic thing in Peter's life you know the girlfriend of his friend likes him and it's going to cause some kind of love triangle or drama that's not the case notice that she pulled him away right at the right moment before he exposed the goblin's lair so uh, something's going on here with Lily she's definitely involved with something and uh, we don't know what yet and again I'm going to leave all that for you later if you want to go I don't want to spoil it for you because it is some pretty cool reveals some good things that happen uh, in the Spider-Man books around this time, at least in my opinion, uh, there was some cool stuff. Uh, so that happens and he's like, whoa, whoa, you're my friend's girl. Like, you know, this can't happen or whatever. And uh, Harry comes back in at that moment and she's like, what's going on here? And he's like, nothing. He's like, you know, we were just talking about whatever. And he's like, all right, cool. So I'm going to leave now. So, he, you know, Harry grabs Lily and like, I think I found what I need. So then they take off. So Peter's like, all right, good. My, my friend, you know, didn't catch that awkward moment of us, but also, um, you know, I, I can't, ex you know, help him on his, on this journey that he's on. Uh, he's going to have to expose his dad on his own, or he's going to have to figure something else out, but I can't be a part of this, uh, at least in this kind of way as Peter Parker. And so at this moment, the story is wrapping up, and we cut to Eddie because we don't know what happened to him. He's in the alley across from the Feast Foundation, and he's like, you know, I want to go back to that life. I want to go back to helping people, but I think I can do better as anti-venom so i'm going to go back out on the streets and i'm going to battle evil this way and that's where the book ends and that's where new ways to die ends and we have our new introduction of eddie brock and his new alter ego the anti-venom i know this was a long episode today guys so thank you so much for watching it i hope you enjoyed it i know i went into a little bit more detail than i normally do but i figured this was an older book and so it didn't matter if i went into that much detail to spoil things with a lot of modern stuff i try to keep it to 10 or 15 minutes so i don't spoil too too much unless i go on a rant obviously but this one i just wanted to talk unfiltered i didn't want to script anything i just wanted to not that i normally script stuff obviously but sometimes i'll make bullet points on things but this time i was like no i just want to go all out i like this storyline a lot i like what it did for eddie brock i like that it brought him back into the spotlight and it kind of rejuvenated my interest in the character because at this point in the comics you know he kind of went away for a while and some of the Matt Gargan stuff I liked but I was really missing Eddie and so this was a great way you know to bring him back into the fold make him a new character put a new spin on him give him new powers and make his goals a little different than they were before but still keeping him in that tone of Eddie with that broken moral compass and uh, even a little bit of that dark humor so this was a really fun trip to go down with you guys I hope you enjoyed it I know again it was a long episode but I appreciate you sticking in here with me if you did I wanted to do something that I would you know just really could talk about at you know in detail and at length for the 250th episode and I'm glad it was this story because this was around the time where my focus went right back to Eddie and where I was really like him as a character again and so it was great I'm, I'm just glad he didn't die as many times as writers try to kill him with him cutting his wrist jumping out of a building you know like all these things that he could have died and ended up not being a character anymore it was just so great to see new writers come in and you know bring him back have him still be alive each time uh, Eddie Brock is definitely a survivor and that is one of the reasons I like him and identify with him as a character is this guy's been through a lot a lot of you know ailments a lot of illnesses uh, both mental and physical and he still came out the other side trying to do the right thing and that is what makes him a character worth talking about and worth making 250 episodes on so here's to many more episodes we're going to continue the story we're going to talk about uh, the secret invasion storyline we're also going to do another carnage week at some point where we talk about carnage usa and family feud and maybe even spider carnage some of the stories we missed last time when we did carnage week uh, so we'll do carnage week two the carnaging uh, is what we're going to call it probably maybe i don't know we'll, we'll, i'll work on the title uh, but we have a lot of other stuff coming up we got a funko pop we're going to look at we got venom first host we're going to review coming up soon uh, and all the episodes we're going to have new intros so thank you to jared bankins 
again for doing the intro to this video and for sending that to us. And we're going to do all the other actors we got for the movie and a couple other ones like Vanilla Vape and Spider-Man and the other intros we got for the show, uh, Marat Michaels. We're going to run through all those over the course of the next like eight or so episodes. And then we'll play those again the week the movie comes out. We'll have those intros come back one last time for the weekend of the movie. So let me know what you think down below of New Ways to Die. Have you read the story? If not, did you mind me going into this much detail? Hopefully you didn't mind the length of this episode, but if you did, let me know and I'll try to cut it back and scale it back next time. But I figured, hey, 250th episode, when comics reach that kind of number, they do a double size issue. So I figured we'll do a double or triple size episode. So let me know what you think of that down below and let me know what you think of the story down below and we'll continue the conversation down there. Thanks for watching my show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.